Hello everybody, my name is Rachel and welcome to my channel Kalanadi. Today it is time for my November favorites in short fiction and science fiction and fantasy. That was a lot of prepositional phrases. Let me rephrase that. I read a bunch of science fiction and fantasy stories in November and I'm going to tell you about the ones that I really, really enjoyed. Almost everything I read, I liked. There were so many that I liked that instead of doing four favorites, I'm gonna do six. <laughs> And I'm going to give you some honorable mentions of things that were reprints. They're not uh, eligible for the Hugo Awards, but I think that they're still good or noteworthy for whatever reason. So that means I have nine things to tell you about, and I better get started on that now. First is Points of Origin by Marissa Lingen. This was published in November 2015 on Tor.com, and it is a beautiful, heartwarming story, more like a vignette, a sketch of a situation than having a definite plot. It's about a couple in their 80s, they live on Mars, and they've never had children. One day, a social worker shows up on their doorstep with their three grandchildren that they didn't know they had from the Oort cloud. So the story is about unexpected family, about adoption, uh, the emotions surrounding that, and it has ice skating and Martian paradox, and and it's about people who love each other. There, there are no like angry moments and people doing bad things. It's people doing the right thing and trying to be honest with each other. I really liked that. It just struck the right chord in me. I don't know if the story's gonna be for everybody because, like I said, it's more like a vignette and it's not super science fictional. It's not very much like speculative fiction, but I had to recommend it because I think it was very well done, it was very beautiful, it was very emotional, and it tackles a topic that I don't think I've ever seen in a science fiction story before. Next is The Practical Witch's Guide to Acquiring Real Estate by A.C. Wise from issue 4 of Uncanny Magazine. I think the title tells you exactly what this is. It's a guide for witches about acquiring real estate and the methods of getting your house, pitfalls and problems to avoid, like not pissing off your neighbor so that they burn you at the stake in the middle of the road. It was fun and really funny in some moments, but also like suddenly dark, like, hey, we're just gonna be like, tell you straight up what happens to witches sometimes. But overall, it maintained this straightforward, practical, how-to guide tone, and it worked really well. I think that this format, the funny guide to structure, can be difficult to do right. I think it's really easy to rely too heavily on like the conceit of the structure to make the story interesting rather than the content and the language itself. And Wise just did it really, really successfully. So it was funny and, and I just like was totally into it. I don't think it really has a plot, but it was just written really well. And uh, no surprise, I've got another Elizabeth Bear story in here as well, uh, in Libres from issue four of Uncanny Magazine as well. Issue four was a really, really good issue for Uncanny Magazine. Go read that if you want to try that magazine. It was excellent. I gave it five stars. Um, my immediate reaction to In Libres was, why can't this be a whole novel? I want this to be a whole novel. I want more of the story. I want more of the world, more of the characters. <laughs> this is a story about a woman at a magical university who is told by her professor that she needs to cite one more source in her thesis. Even though her thesis is done, she has to add in one more source for completion, but she has to go into the library, into a special collection, and get this book, which is an adventure. She's risking life and limb. She suckers her friend who is a centaur, and to going with her, and they have to brave the library. There's a dragon librarian that gets huffy at them because they want to skip ahead in the hold queue, and at that point, I just lost it. <laughs> this just reminded me of Harry Potter in some ways, like if Harry Potter went to graduate school, students braving the dangers of the library and the books that might hurt you, you know? It has friendship, no romance in it, library books that might injure you, and monsters roaming the stacks. Highly recommended. 
pure fun, really well done. Next is Folding Beijing by Hao Jingfeng, translated by Ken Liu from Chinese. This is also from Uncanny Magazine. No surprise, but it's from issue two, not issue four. Next is Folding Beijing by Hao Jingfeng. This was translated by Ken Liu from Chinese, and it's also from Uncanny Magazine, though it is an issue two, not issue four. This story is set in a Beijing of the future, which has been rebuilt into three sides that rotate. You have the first city that gets most time, uh, most time while the other two cities are sleeping, the elite rich live there. So they have the most time and the most space. Then there's the second city where the upper class live. They don't get as much time, they don't get as much space as the first city, but they get more than the third city. The third city is where almost everybody else lives, the poor, the people who do all the hard work, the waste management and disposal, for example. And the story is about a man who lives in the third city who is trying to do anything he can to make the, enough money to send his daughter to a good kindergarten. And he takes a job to deliver a message and then bring back a reply from the second city to the first city and then back again. It's a job of a lifetime. All he has to do is get from one city to another when they rotate. There's an interview with the author in this issue of Uncanny Magazine that talks more about what she intended the story to be about. Like, clearly you could read in a lot of stuff about um, the social classes, the differences between the rich and the poor, and the economic implications of the situation in this rotating city, in this folding city. But what she said that ultimately she wanted the story to be about was about a man who wants to do right by his young daughter. He wants to send his daughter to school, and he wants to make money to do that. Everything else might be kind of secondary. This is also the first translated Chinese story where I felt like the language and the storytelling was more like Western stories. If you found that translated fiction by people like Liu Cixin has turned you off, like it's just not quite what you're used to, then maybe try this story because Maybe it's the author's style is more like what we're used to, or it could be that Ken Liu's translation was particularly good in um, expressing the cultural stuff, but and it could be a combination of the two as well. It just felt a lot easier to read, a lot more like what I was used to, and I would recommend it for feeling more accessible because of that. I also have to recommend Pocosin, I don't know how to pronounce that, <laughs> by Ursula Vernon. This was published early, early in 2015 in Apex Magazine, and it's about a possum god slowly dying under a witch's porch while God and the devil bargain for his soul, and then death shows up. I love Vernon's style, and this story is no exception. She has a lot of practical, no-nonsense female characters who are tired of the world, they just want to get on with their gardening, they want to not deal with people's stupidity anymore, they don't want to have to fix other people's problems all the time. This story has all of that. It's just a great story, it's not to be missed, especially if you liked her World Fantasy Award and Nebula-nominated story Jackalope Wives, which was fantastic. Um, and maybe also if you're a fan of the stories that she writes under her Tin Kingfisher pen name like The Seventh Bride. And the final story that was published in 2015 that I want to tell you about is By Degrees and Dilatory Time by S.L. Wang. This was published in May 2015 in Strange Horizons. In this story, a man loses his eyes to cancer and he gets uh, immediately gets bionic replacements and then he has to adjust to how his eyes are different. If you've ever had a medical procedure that has changed you in some way and then you had to adjust to this new normal with this knowledge that your body is different and you think that everybody can see that when they look at you and that you will never not be thinking about how you're different, then read this story. I just found the character's internal journey about how he was thinking about his body and the progress he was making every day, it was just really touching, and I saw some of my own experience in it. 
And finally, some honorable mentions. These are stories that were not originally published in 2015. They are reprints this year, so not eligible for the Hugo Awards. They're not translations or anything either, but I read them and I thought other people might want to know about these. First, St. Dymphna's School for Poison Girls by Angela Slatter was reprinted by Tor.com. This is a story from her 2014 collection, The Bitterwood Bible, which just won a World Fantasy Award. I sought this out specifically because I wanted a sample of story from that collection and it was so good. I think I might have liked it even more than I liked her novella of Sarwan, such was one of my favorites from October, so really, really good. Then there is The Nalander by Anne Leckie. This was reprinted by Uncanny Magazine. It is actually from 2008, so it's a pretty old story, and if you read it, I think you will totally recognize that the same person wrote the Imperial Raj series, even though it's very different. It's more like a fairy tale. It has gods, like an animal disguises, making bargains with girls, and there's lost treasure and then a river god and everything. It's kind of an interesting take on a female character who just does her own thing, and I really liked that. Um, but I think that the culture, the civilization that she's describing in this story will be recognizable to people who have read about like the pre-annexation cultures in the Imperial Raj series. Just a slight connection there. I thought it was very well written, and I think I need to seek out some more of Anne Leckie's early stuff. And last but not least, I and Gamora by Samuel R. Delaney was reprinted by Strange Horizons in November 2015. This is his 1966 Nebula award-winning short story. It's an excellent taste of Delaney, if you want to read a story by him for free, it is short, it has his writing style, it has kind of the characters and settings that he uses, it just has the whole taste of Delaney on it, and also talks about some topics and themes that always appear in his stuff, specifically sexuality, gender, that kind of thing. It's not going to be for everyone. I have to say this is probably not my favorite thing I've ever read by Delaney, but I think it is very much like his work. Um, and it's for free online. I would say that you should read the introduction that Jeff Ryman wrote for it for Strange Horizons. Um, it explains why the story is so unusual for the 60s when it was written. I was very surprised when I read the introduction, but also kind of not because Delaney is more, like, progressive or whatever the word is than some of his peers were in the 60s and 70s, so definitely recommend it as well. Those are all of my short fiction favorites from November. If you've read any of these and you want to talk about them, please let me know. I think all of these stories are available for free online, so there will be a bunch of links in the description box down below so you can go off and read any of these if you want to. And as always, if you have any recommendations for me of stories or authors or free places to get short stories online, please let me know. I'm always looking for new ones. And once again, thank you for watching, and I will be back to talk to you again later. Bye.